Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. I'm uh, Sophie Rayworth and I'm talking to you from the uh, BBC newsroom in central London. Um, and it is a great honour to join you this evening to talk to Raina Wynne, who I discovered about a year ago when I was on the southwest coast path in Cornwall with some friends and they told me about this book that I had to read about a couple who lived on a farm in Wales who had been there for many many years and who had invested in a business and it had all gone wrong a friend's business and it had all gone wrong and they had suddenly found themselves homeless nothing all their money taken up in a court case and having to pay debts and the book began with them hiding under the stairs waiting for the bailiffs to come on top of that they discovered that Moth, Raina's husband, had a terminal illness and absolutely at their wits end, what did they do? They put on backpacks and they set off to walk the 630 mile beautiful coast path from North Devon all the way around through to, I think, Poo, um, in Dorset. It is the most incredible story. I'm sure you're all here because you've already read it. But uh, when I got to the end of it, I was desperate, I had questions I needed to know. And uh, I managed to track down Raina at the Cheltenham Literary Book Festival in October. And uh, I said to her, I've got to, can we, can we meet? And I rushed over to the bar where she was the night before she was talking about her book and lobbed questions at her for a good half an hour. And one of the things she told me that evening was that she had just written or was about to finish her next book, which I have to say I was quite surprised by because I just thought it was a one-off story. But here it is. The Wild Silence, and this is her sequel to The Salt Path. Um, she finished it at the end of last year, and when I was given a copy of it, an early copy of it, um, it was, I was really nervous about reading it, because I said to, um, I said to the publicist who sent me the early copy, I said, I don't like reading sequels. Is it as good as The Salt Path? because I always, the books I really love, I kind of just like to keep there. And she said, no, I promise you it is. I think it's even better. And she was actually right. It is just, I wouldn't say it's better because I don't want to send you better than Salt Puff, but it is absolutely fantastic. So it is um, great, a great pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Raina Wynne, who joins us from her house in Cornwall. There she is. I am unfortunately having problems hearing Rainy. I think you need to unmute yourself. There we go. That'll, that'll, that'll work better, won't it? No, that helps. <laughs> Hello, Rainy. How lovely to see you. I have to say, I saw you a few minutes ago. You look like you're in Corfu or something, not not uh, not Cornwall. It looks very sort of Mamma Mia where you're sitting. <laughs> so much vegetation. <laughs> now, tell me about, let's talk first of all, before we talk about the new book, because I did, as you know, track you down to that bar in uh, the hotel you were staying in in Cheltenham. And my first question, actually, I asked you on Twitter, I found you on Twitter first, how is Moth? Because when you get to the end of the salt path, we all just go, and how is he? Because it's such a, an incredible story about you as a couple and his diagnosis and, and the transformative power of walking. Yeah. And I got to the end and I thought, how is he? So how is he? He's not as well as he was when we finished walking the, the southwest coast path but uh, still in much better health than the doctors and the consultants say he should be we just keep as active as we possibly can out in the uh, environment and um, for now for now he's found a plateau um, which we try to stay on by just keeping active <laughs> and are you still able to do walks do long walks because that is what you both grew up on well, absolutely. We walk as much as we can. Obviously, during lockdown, it's been very difficult to, to walk for any distance, but um, we found ourselves in quite a beautiful rural spot, so we've managed to keep walking through, through all of this. Now, what I wanted to know when I met you was how, you know, I kind of had visions of you setting off on this coastal path and thinking, I'm going to write the story of it and, and recording it as you went. But that wasn't the case, was it? No, not at all. When we started walking, I don't think there could have been anything further from our minds than writing a book about it. Um, so we didn't even keep a journal. There was nothing. Uh, but we did have Paddy Dillon's fantastic little guidebook. And uh, every night in the tent, Moth would write penciled notes in the margins of that guidebook. Just notes about where we camped or, or people we'd met and people we'd bumped into and things that had happened. 
so that when I did sit down to think actually I'm going to write these notes up then I had Paddy's great descriptions and the, uh, the OS map that runs right through the guidebook and then Moth's amazing pencil notes in the margins so that's where the salt path came from. But what amazed me when we spoke was that it wasn't, you didn't write that six months later, you wrote that, was it two years later? Two years later, yeah, yeah, it was two years later. And uh, you could easily say, you know, how, how would you recall it after two years? But um, I think that was the magic about that guidebook. When I opened it, those crinkled pages that had the, that had the shape of, of sand that had been moved by the tide, they, they were bent and crisp, and, but they were full of bits of sand, they were full of pressed flowers, and they were full of those beautiful notes that Moth had made and as I opened it it was almost as if as if I was back on the path as if I could feel the wind and smell the salt and and I was just back there and yeah it might it have does been work. Bit, but didn't feel you like said <laughs> you did say to me because we were talking about the, the art of writing and I, I said I'd like to write about something I did a couple of years ago and I don't think I can remember it enough and you said put yourself in the moment and just let your mind go and it really it does work actually it is incredible what your brain can recall when when you just sit there and just let your mind wander it, it is it is and you think you've forgotten things but if you if you just really allow yourself to be re-immersed in that moment then then you can start to feel it again you can start to smell it and 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 then you're there and easy and you you started writing this book because now this is what you get into in the uh, in the wild silence and i just want to say to everybody watching now i i love i love reading i love books i i have a sort of slight phobia about reviews sometimes because i don't want to give away i don't want to read too much about the story so i'm not going to give it all away but i will talk to about some of the things in there and one of them is you talk about the whole process of writing the salt path in this book the, the wild silence it it you go you get to the end of your salt path and then you look back and that includes your journey on the salt path and how you came to write about it and it wasn't to be published was it explain what you did it for no um moth's illness means that eventually he's going to start to lose his memory and he was starting to forget things he was starting to forget little details of our walk little little memories that i was holding and when when i tried to get him to recall them to me he was forgetting them so i wanted to write just down a record of our walk, just to maybe write up his notes even, just so that there was something tangible that he could open a book and say, yes, I remember that walk. And that's where it came from, um, was, was simply writing it for Moth so that he could open it and he'd be there on the path next to me. And, and he didn't know you were doing it, did he? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Um, so I completed it and then printed it off on the home computer, started in black and ended in pink. And, um, <laughs> an entire thing been there. and just gave it to him for his birthday. And um, yeah, and then it went from there. Really. I, love the, I love the way you just said I just gave it to him for his birthday, because I have to say that bit in the book. So if you imagine I go to work on the tube here and I was reading that bit in the book, um, I was standing on the platform of the uh, the Victoria line at Victoria and I got to that bit in the book and it is you write it so beautifully and so delicately but so emotionally and it's all about how you tie the string around the, the paper and you print it all off and it's on his birthday and you put it on the tray and you've obviously been writing this for months and he doesn't know what it is and it was so moving it made me cry I missed two tubes <laughs> I literally had to put my sunglasses on and stand oh. there with my back to the tube well, I finish the pages and get to the end of it, but it is so simple. But it was such a it was such a beautiful gift to him. Um, and you, you know, you talk about the moment. It must have been an extraordinary moment when you gave it to him. I'm sorry it made you cry, Sophie. <laughs> no, no, that's good. It's a good. It's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, it it, it was. Um, I'd spent months writing it, obviously, while Moth was away at university during the days um so he didn't really know what he, i was writing he knew i was doing something but he didn't really know what it was um and so i got months and months of effort had gone into this and, and then i printed it off and tied it with string because i hadn't even got anything to wrap it with um and as i handed it over to him nobody had read it it hadn't been even seen by anyone else and i was i was really nervous because it was the first thing i'd written 
since I was a teenager leaving school it was the first thing and um, so I, I was very nervous not only that that somebody was going to read what I'd written but but that I was giving this huge wadge of emotion tied up with string to him for his birthday and, and would he receive it in the way it was being given yeah it was it was quite an emotional thing to do really. and what was his reaction he was stunned not only that uh, that I'd actually hidden this from him for all these months but that I could write that I could write enough to actually fill all those pages yeah, yeah it was quite an amazing thing and um, the, re the result was that your daughter who was staying with you and again you you talk about this in the book your daughter is staying with you and says oh well, I might read it too and she she rushes through it doesn't she and then suggests you have it published yes you know children being what they are yeah she did definitely read it before uh, moth did <laughs> and, um, she said you know you should do something with this mom it's it's not bad um but i sort of hovered around the idea of maybe trying to get it published but i was i was in my 50s and um and i had no writing experience no no literary credentials at all so it, it seemed quite almost an impossibility the thought of actually getting it published um, but at that point I thought actually I've got quite a lot to say about homelessness so I offered a, um, I offered a, an article to the Big Issue magazine and they picked that up straight away and, and ran with it and it was, it was published a couple of weeks later. So after that when I'd actually had something published then I felt I could sort of have a look for an agent and it went from there. And it had such extraordinary success um, and so quickly, didn't it? Did you ever imagine that that could happen? No, not at all. Not at all. I thought, you know, if, if a couple of thousand people buy it, then that will be an enormous success and I'll be very, very happy. Um, but it quickly, it quickly ran away from that initial thought of maybe 2000. So, so it was very unexpected. And the extraordinary thing as well is that the book that you wrote and that you gave to Moth, it was called, what was it called? The, the Black with the Blue, what did you title it? The Lightly Salted Blackberries. That's it, from Zen Ahead, wasn't it? You've used, that's to remind him of Zen Ahead. It was, yes, yeah, and it was a little story that I tell in the salt path about meeting some, some old gentleman who offered us some blackberries. And, uh, and the, actually those blackberries were so special, they were so full of that beautiful purple flavour of autumn and um, and when I asked them this lovely old man where those blackberries had come from because I'd never tasted anything like it before then he said oh no this is something so special this is something that you only get when the mist comes in and lays a layer of salt on a perfectly ripe blackberry and what you get is something that chefs can't create and money can't buy it's a gift of time and nature and i'd held on to that after that walk finished i'd held on to that because it felt like that's what the walk was for us a gift and uh, so it seemed like the perfect title to me absolutely ideal but the first thing penguin said to me was that title has got to go it's not <laughs> book so uh, so sadly I had to let go of my blackberries <laughs> but the amazing thing as I said to you last year the amazing thing that I discovered you told me was I you know you people write books like this and they get them they're completely rewritten they're re you know rejigged do this do that how much we're going to tell people how much they actually changed we did uh, we did change one chapter around a one chapter <laughs> but one. other than that it wasn't it wasn't really changed it was just um it was just i corrected my grammar here and there and, and little bits of sentence construction but otherwise that was it that was that was and this, the same as well for the wild silence yes maybe even less for the wild silence but i think i've got the hang of it now so <laughs> You've definitely got the hang of it. You are, I mean, I, you are, I'm not, I'm not trying to flatter you or anything like that, but you are a beautiful writer. I've read a lot of books and I've read a lot of debut novelists and I've read a lot of, you know, people starting out judging them for prizes and things. And you are, your flow is beautiful. You just, you just nail it. You're not overly flowery about nature. You just, you conjure up beautiful images and you do it effortlessly, which is, is such a gift. Um, talk about the start of The Wild Silence because it is, you, it's New Year's Day, you're in Cornwall, 
explain where you are in Cornwall because you start out in Cornwall in the little, little house that has come about because of the salt bath, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, but you're feeling very restless. Yes, we're, we're living in the, um, in the apartment at the back of a fantastic old Methodist chapel in Pol Ruin. The, um, the accommodation that we've been offered at the end of the salt path. And everything should be absolutely perfect. Our homeless life's over and, and moth's going to uni and everything's beginning again. But I'm restless and I'm agitated and I can't work out why I can't settle and why I can't sleep. And so at the very beginning of Wild Silence, it's, it's New Year's Day, the very, very early hours of New Year's Day. And I find myself out on the cliffs, on the coast path, just looking for something and I don't really know what it is. I can't, I can't pin down a sense of what it is that I need that's going to make me feel like I'm okay. And that's, that's where the wild silence begins. In that moment of, of not feeling like I can possibly settle back into life, back into any kind of, of normality and not really understanding why. And so your response to that? You go home. Yes, I go home and, and um, I can't sleep. But um, I felt something when I'm out on that on that cliff top. That sense of being there between the edge of the land and the start of the sea. That's I think I say that sense of being. For a moment, I'm found. I'm lost, but for a moment, I'm found. Let me I, read. Let me read them the words that you've yes. here because I wrote it's such a beautiful quote. You say at the edge of the land and the start of the sea in a space between worlds, at a time between years, in a life between lives. I'm lost, but here, at least for a moment, I'm found. And that leads you back to your tent, doesn't it? It does. That sense of there had been a moment where I was found. That moment when we were on the salt path, when we were on the southwest coast path, when I felt as if everything was complete. And so I go back to the chapel and we put the tent up in the bedroom and <laughs> I get back in the tent and there's that sense of coming home, that sense of absolute relief because I'm back where I should be and, and sleep at last. And it's the same mattresses and the smell and everything, isn't it? You yes. describe the smell as you crawl back into your tent. Did Moth go with you or did he think, what no, are you doing? No, he got quite used to the mattress by then. So, <laughs> so he was still on the mattress in the other corner. But as I got back into that tent, there was that, that damp plastic smell of the tent. And, and as I unrolled the mats, I was sanding them. But the sleeping bag still held some of that, that smell of the salt air and... And with that, I could, I could feel the wind and I could feel the, the freedom and the sense of belonging that I'd had on that coast path. And I zipped the tent shut and I, I might have been in the bedroom, but I could have been back on the, back on the coast path. Because that's <laughs> I how love it. that image. Did you ever take photographs? Like, I just love the image of you with your tent up inside. Um, but you struggled, didn't you? I mean, this was the beginning of, you know, you, you're back in a, you're in a village, I say back, but you hadn't lived in a village before. And you document in the wild silence very well how difficult it was for you to go and live in a village having lived out in the middle of nowhere on the land for a long time it was it was difficult on so many different levels not only have we just finished walking the southwest coast path with that incredible sense of of wild space and freedom that we'd had um it was more than that i'd grown up on a farm Moth and I had lived in a very quiet rural place, almost isolated. So to find myself in a village was an absolute change in life that I wasn't expecting. I'd never lived in a village before, never encountered that fact that I would walk out of the door and I'd have to engage with other people immediately on leaving the door. Um, other people, I think, might find the idea of living in quite an isolated spot really difficult or maybe impossible even. But for me, I think it was the absolute opposite. I was, I was in that village and I, could, I felt as if the walls were closing in on me and I, I couldn't settle at all. I, I found the adjustment really hard. But maybe, maybe it was maybe even more than that. I think I was carrying, still carrying something of that homeless experience with me. Still a little bit of that sense of distrust of other people that came from the experiences and the, the, 
interactions we'd had with people who had reacted so badly to our homelessness. I think maybe I was still carrying some of that sense of, of rejection from society. And I think as a result, I, was, I started to withdraw. I started to withdraw from people, from society, from everywhere. And, and I, was, uh, I was finding myself behind the chapel or out on the coast path and away and alone as much as I possibly could. So not the idyllic end to uh, our homeless experience that, to, that we expected it to be, that's for sure. <laughs> because you, you get it, you, you're sort of adopted, as it were, by Jill, is it? Who you meet flower arranging in the village, yes. is that right? Yes. And she invites you to her house. And I just thought this, I mean, this really sums up what you were just talking about. But I know, you know, as you're going along the path that you're always dodging the questions about what you're actually doing and you never really tell people the true story. For obvious reasons you don't want to go there but somebody asks you at this this is i think it's a drink or a dinner at jill's house and you say somebody asks you um what you're doing there and you can't walk away from them at this point you say somebody asks you and you say i'm we and you say i couldn't formulate the words i couldn't say i had a home a place i loved and put my whole life and my whole self into but i lost it and you haven't seen me because i've tried to avoid just this moment the moment when someone asks me to explain myself. And you and Moth had, had walked away from that for a very long time, hadn't you? And that, I suppose that for you is, is the real difficulty of being in one place. That's it, that's it. I think um, it was so hard to, to find a way to tell people what had happened to us. And in a village, people always want to know your backstory. What, how come you, you found yourself there? Um, but I found it so hard to express that because I would have had to have gone back into all the, the pain and difficulty that led us onto the, the coast path. But then I was expecting the same reaction that we'd had from so many people who reacted with prejudice and, and preconceptions to, to our homelessness. So I was expecting that from people within the village and I couldn't walk away. I couldn't, I would have had to have, found a way to live with that and I think I hadn't I hadn't reconciled it within myself so I couldn't I couldn't express that to other people I think I can't imagine anyone treating you badly or you know rejecting you or you know you're charming and you're lovely to talk to so tell us about that experience about the homeless experience and what it was that was was so raw for you I think it was it was came primarily from the shock of the suddenness that it happened to us. So from living our ordinary lives of of running our holiday cottage where people were coming to stay with us to share our home for their holidays, and then suddenly to find myself out living in a tent on the coast path with virtually no money, just wild camping on those headlands. And that when we expressed our homelessness to people, for them to almost physically recoil, you know, to draw their dogs in on the retractable leads and gather their children, that came as such a surprise, such a shock. Um, and we began to protect ourselves against that by simply just not saying that we'd lost our home. But when people asked why we'd got so much time to walk, simply by saying, but we'd sold our house and now we were just going where the wind blows, having a midlife moment. So we'd escaped the need to actually explain ourselves. But here in the village, it, it wasn't so easy to, to dodge questions. And, and what, is it they, what is it they were recoiling from there? Because, you know, you're a couple and I think you're in your 40s when it happened. You're a married couple walking together. Yeah. What, what did you feel? Was it, was it, did you know they were recoiling or did you sense, did you have a feeling they were? I think both. I think you could, almost, you could see it in people, a reaction of almost fear, I think. Fear of what homelessness represents to so many people. That the sense that most people were come to it through their own, their own fault or through some sort of substance or alcohol abuse it's it's such a a strong prejudice that so many people carry through lack of understanding i think really more than anything else and so so that recoil that rejection i think comes really from fear and misunderstanding there's a wonderful moment in this book as well when you meet a young boy up on the coast path this is this is later and uh, you're you're up on the coast path and you meet this boy and he starts talking to you and 
he's and you ask him what he's doing and he's i think he's walking from plymouth or he's walked from he's he's walking along anyway a long stretch of the path and uh and his inspiration Raina? absolutely it was it was a few <laughs> weeks after the uh, big issue article had been um published and i was up on the coast path and uh, i saw a backpacker coming towards me and he wasn't the average backpacker he was he was wearing a, a bright a bright fluorescent like road workers jacket and as he got closer i could see that he, he was wearing really quite old equipment like a, an old rucksack with the frame on the outside not something a, a person in their early 20s would normally be seen using and then as we met at a gate and i opened the gate for him to go through it was my turn to say you know how come you you're walking where are you heading to where have you come from and he said oh i've only been walking for a couple of weeks um I started in Penzance and um, I said, well, you know, why are you walking? What's drawn you here? Because he obviously didn't look like a, an average walker. And he said, well, I read an article in The Big Issue about a couple who'd been homeless and, um, and they just put a rucksack on and walked the southwest coast path. So I thought, if they can do it, I can do it. I said, well, come back, come and have a cup of tea, come and have something to eat. And he said, no, I can't. I can't because already this path has changed me and it's changed the way i live i've got to keep walking i've got to find somewhere to put my tent up and eat my soup and there was just something so amazing in that moment that as i watched him go i could see how the path had changed his life already changed his life and in a way it changed ours and there was something really really powerful in what he was doing and it, it was it was that day that that I went to the back to the to the chapel and I started to look for an agent because I thought if that story just in its shortened form in the big issue could change one person's life then maybe it's worth sharing maybe it's a story that that might that might be heard by other people. But, but you didn't tell him it was you though, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't because it was his mum. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, you're so modest i know but it's wonderful and you let him have his moment yeah. but i mean you know <laughs> i'm the news journalist here i'm like you know it's her. Um, oh, but, uh, but it was it was his moment and it was so special for him that that i think it had to stay his his thing and not not dis distract from that or reduce it by saying oh me too it, it, I think yeah. that's lovely. Well, it's not me too, though, is it? It was you, and it, you know, it was you that you. Anyway, I think that's. I just. It's a wonderful sign of your character. I thought when I read that, and I was waiting for you to say, and I told him it was me, and actually, you just let him on his way, and you let him enjoy his peace and his path, and and his story rather than including yours. And I just thought, you know, it's very a very gracious way to do it. Exactly. Um, in the <laughs> in the wild silence, you you know, you really do turn your hand to what you obviously did in the first book but you really let go and and turn your hand to the the writing about the land and the nature and what it means to you because it, you know it's it's in your blood isn't it it's you through and through absolutely i think i think i started to um to try to write about how we'd found a way back to some sort of self-belief and and to reconcile ourselves with the past and everything was leading me back to our connection to the natural world and and how that was that was the, the real strong part of our lives the strength that we'd drawn on to refine that core of who we were and try to rebuild our lives and in doing that I think to try to really explain that that connection to to nature i had to go back to points in my childhood points in the early life of moth and i together and and to really explore that in order to try to make any sense of it and to to show how that had shaped our lives before and after the, the salt path yeah and it's i mean you meet moth the the book is also and both books actually are a wonderful love story and they are you know at the core of both of them is your relationship with moth and you met moth and you talk about meeting moth and the wonderful courtship you have um and again i'm not going to give too much away because it's very much part of the story but you you talk about how you met him at the age of 18 and he blew you away with his energy and his you know he he was just out there doing it the buzz the fizz 
Um, and he just blew you away with that. He yeah. was a townie though, wasn't he? And that, mm. that grew, you know, that brought with it an awful, awful lot of problems with your parents. It did. It did. I mean, my my experience of of the natural world was was from a, a very from a farming background, from a very rural, domestic almost um, experience of nature. In in the way that you know, my life was just bound up with the seasons, with the with the rhythm of the farm. But when I met Moth, his his view of the natural world was something much bigger. He he had a real passion for the wild places, for the mountains, for the for the coast, for for the places where you could you could feel that sense of a much bigger horizon. And and when we came together, I think it was it was just those two things came together and we started to see the natural world as a whole. But my my parents were farmers and um, their view of how my future would be maybe wasn't didn't lie with moth who had grown up on the edge of a town but still had this great passion for the for the natural world but he wasn't a farmer he had no acres so in a lot of ways they felt that he was he was not right for me and it led to all sorts of of problems between us yeah but i mean it's very it's very it's very raw what you write particularly about your mother because your mother in the book you talk about her your relationship with her as a child but also in the book and much later on when she has a stroke she gets pneumonia and then has a stroke and you spend her last two weeks with her in hospital and through that you're you're living your relationship with your mother from from all those years ago but she literally talked to you and said you she made i think she even used the word ashamed she was ashamed of you for for ending up with moth that's right and i think i think as I, as I was writing about that time with with my mum as she was ill in hospital i think what i was trying to do was to explain that connection to nature and as as she was ill it took me back to that that landscape that countryside where i'd grown up um and so obviously back to those childhood teenage memories but i think through that time with her and through that time with exploring my my childhood i think i came to understand that maybe maybe their problems with moth were actually far more fundamental than i realized and had i not had I seen it differently at the time, I might have viewed the whole situation differently. I think, I think at the time I was so bound up in my, in my relationship with Moth that their rejection of him was paramount. It was everything to me. But then I think during that time, and I think, I think when you go through those really dark moments in life, I think those dark corners of life can be where you see, where you see yourself the most clearly. I think it's, it can be where you discover more about yourself than you do maybe when you're out in the sunlight. And I think I started to realise that I'd always had that really deep connection to the land and a really deep need for, for the natural world. And maybe they, they had known that. And the only way that they saw that I would have any sort of happiness in my life would have been on a farm, married to a farmer. Um, but maybe they just didn't have the, the, the language or the, the words to, to express that. So to me, it came over as, you're not marrying a farmer and he's not good enough. But I think, I think there's a reconciliation in that part, I think, with, with that experience of the teenage years, with, with that recognising the importance of, of the natural environment in our lives. And that's that runs right through the wild silence, I think. That reconciliation with, with the importance of the, the natural world and how, how it's formed the core of who we are and our inner strength sort of really comes from that. And how it calms your mind. And you, you talk about going back to your childhood home where you grew up in the periods in between when you were in the hospital with your mother. Um, and those two weeks must have been, I mean, she was, they said she was going to survive a couple of days, didn't she, didn't they, after her stroke? And yes. she actually lived on for two weeks. And it, it was, 
I'm sure very, oh, well, it was traumatic just reading it. It's just an awful thing to see, but even more difficult for you given what, you know, the diagnosis that Mop had been given. Yes, it was traumatic. It was difficult. Um, I think, I think I wrote about it because I think death is something we don't talk about enough. And yet it's something that we're all going to experience with our loved ones. But there was something far more for me in that, in that experience than losing my mum, which was hard enough in itself. It was in the same way that had been diagnosed for moth's demise to follow. And for me, I think, I think what I was trying to express was how hard it was to keep the death that I was living through as something separate from the one that would come. And the, the two were just enmeshing in, in one time of, of trauma about what was happening and fear about what the future might hold, um, which goes on to then affect what happens later in the wild silence and the decisions we make. So. Mm. Which involve, and I'm not going to give it all away, but involve walking and you go on another wonderful big walk. Um, when you're writing your books, how difficult do you now find it? Because, you know, you are, by all accounts and by your own admission, you were incredibly shy. Moth is, I've met Moth when, when I came and found you at the Cheltenham Festival, didn't I? He was there. And Moth is, is a wonderful, open, smiley, lovely, very solid. He's got a real presence. And you describe yourself as someone very shy. I can see how well you work together, just in the, the small room meeting we had. But when you are or were someone who was so shy until very recently, how do you, first of all, deal with telling us all about your life? Well, in the salt path, it was easy, obviously, because I wasn't telling anyone other than moth. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so, so that was easy. I think if I'd known that so many people were going to read that book, I might not have put quite so much in there. <laughs> I might have just held back a little bit on the bowel habits. Uh, who knows? <laughs> um, but when it came to, the, to writing The Wild Silence, um, it, it was a different experience completely because obviously I knew this time that people would read it and so there was that sense of I should I should hold back now I should hold back on the emotion hold back on on the truth of of the feelings of things or the rawness of something or the ju sheer joy of something I should I should just temper it and mellow it out a bit but but then I thought actually I can't write that way I think if I'm going to write an experience I've got I've got to tell it as, as it felt. I can, I've got to make you smell it and hear it and, and, and otherwise I'll feel as if I'm, I'm not writing at all. And it's a great skill to have because as I said earlier you do it without overdoing it so it, it, you don't, it doesn't jar in any sense and you just really do. I really you know, just soaked up your joy of the land and, and the highs and the lows and everything you were going through. But my second question about being shy was you know, how do you do things like this? Because you write in The Wild Silence about your first public appearance at a book festival when you're in the loo, terrified, aren't you, shaking? <laughs> but you look so happy and calm and relaxed now. Mm, Zoom, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, to start with, it was, it was horrifying because when uh, Penguin um, took the book and said that they were going to publish it, I thought that was it. I just handed it over. <laughs> and oh, no. Say, oh, no, not at all. And then they said, oh, no, now you've got to do um, publicity and uh, you've got to actually go to events and talk to people about it. Well, I was horrified. Just the thought of that was just terrifying. Um, yeah, so that experience that I write about in uh, The Wild Silence, about being on that stage, that was how it was. I had been hiding in the toilets before we got on that stage, and it was, <laughs> it was terrifying. But I think, I think in the events that came after that, it started to change, because it wasn't there in those frightening moments on the stage when the lights were on me and all that, I could barely breathe. It was in the signing queues afterwards when people came to have their books signed. And they would tell me their stories and, and tell me how they connected to my book and or tell me what had happened in their lives that had, had made them look for something, look for an answer, look for another way of living. And I think there was something there in that connection, that sense of unity between, between people, that sense of humanity 
that started to break down that barrier between me and other people. And then, then I started to get letters and messages from people who'd read the book. And their stories were so, were so powerful and so, well, it was just a connection. I could, I could really feel a really basic sense of connection with other people. And I think, I think that was part of, of when I started to write The Wild Silence. I had that in my mind that, that people had connected so much with, with me just sharing our story in such a, an honest and open way that I couldn't, I couldn't write then in a, in a withheld and slightly, slightly shadowed way. I had to, I had to carry on in the way I'd, mm. I'd uh, started. <laughs> So we haven't even got to where you are now, and I'm going to come to that in a moment because we can. That's a lovely story about where you're actually sitting right now. But I do have a couple of questions which I'm just going to uh, send you or ask you from people who are watching. So Viv Dawson um, emailed, and she's in Suffolk, and she uh, contacted us a while ago saying, having read, loved, and recommended the Salt Path to so many of my friends, and even been to walk a little bit of the path for ourselves, I'd like to ask you whether you do, on some level, miss your old life. I presume she means the coast path life, or do you miss you? You must miss your other life as well, but or the other life. Um, well, if she means the other life, well, in in a uh, to some extent, obviously, obviously so because that was home and it was stability and everything that we built up and built towards. Um, but at the same time, no, because what made us leave there took us onto the coast path and only by being on that coast path did we find a way for moth's health, health to, to find some sort of plateau. Do I miss the coast path? Do I miss life in that tent and, and the wild, incredible rawness of living in that tent every day? Oh, do you? Yeah, and if, if somebody said, you've got to start that path again, I'd be packing my books out right now. <laughs> Yeah, you could though, I suppose. I mean, you, or you could do another one. Well, yeah, actually, talking about rucksacks, I did have it out yesterday, and I was repacking it. So, next year, next year, maybe next year, have you, definitely. Have you, have you got uh, definitely? I know, I love it. Have you got any in mind? Yes, I've got. I've got quite a quite a long path in mind in this country. But are you going to tell us or not? Now? No. no. <laughs> A long path. I'm going to go and look at my trails map. Um, I've got another question here. I've sort of covered it a bit, but I'm going to ask you, you know, because what she writes is lovely as well. Jane Trotter says, um, hello, Raina. Thank you for writing with such honesty. Can you tell me how easy or possibly tricky you found it opening up and sharing such personal experiences in your writing? Some of them are painful and heartbreaking, but above all, there is a very basic sense of hopeful hopefulness expressed in the way you write. And everyone should read your books, especially now when some of us are trying to make sense of what's going on in the world it is you've talked already about opening up but i mean there's she has a very valid point there given what is going on at the moment mm. connections and people's experiences and you know all the things that are happening around us it, this does chime very much with that I, th I think um that's partly why i went back to my childhood in the wild silence because i think so many of us do that when when things are difficult when we're going through a trauma we sort of take ourselves back even if it's only internally to a safer place to a to a time when things felt felt right felt as they should be because i think sometimes we do that and then we can we can find our way forwards again from having found that solid ground from that 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 stable place and i think that's what i was i was looking for in wild silence i think i was trying to track down my point of stability in order that i could build again back towards the future but in doing that i found that it was all about the natural world so i had to take that with me then into the rest of the book and into into what comes next and one other question here from sarah jane who says uh, did your time on the cliff path affect any religious beliefs you might have um well, if you've read the Salt Path, you know I'm, I'm not a, a person with any deep belief in anything, really. Um, but I do go on to explore other, other possibilities of spirituality or, uh, to some degree in the wild silence. I think if I believe in anything at all, 
it's about the natural world. It's that we are, as a, as a race, as a species, the human thing is part of the natural environment. We're not, we're not observers of it. We're not outside of it. We are the natural environment. We're as, we're as exposed to it and as vulnerable as birding a hedgerow. And surely, you know, the, the pandemic that we're going through is a, has shown us that, that we are part of it. And I think there's a part in, in um, Wild Silence where we're standing in an incredibly cold, remote place and we're witnessing the, the northern lights, Aurora Borealis. And there's a sense of, of the universe almost reaching down to the earth and that incredible connection of molecules. So if I believe anything, it's probably that that we're all part of one whole living organism. And it's not a, an environment or a climate that we need to protect because it's us. It's not something separate to us. It's one thing. And, and if, we don't, if we don't protect the whole, then we have no place left. Yeah, I believe very lucky. Very, I'm very jealous. You managed to see the Northern Lights. I've always wanted to see those. Um, <laughs> yeah, <we're not. laughs> what I want you to tell us about now is, and you talk about it a lot in the book, uh, in the Wild Silence. But where you are right now, because you no longer live in the little village in Cornwall, um, the book, the coast, the salt path had a wonderful effect, and uh, it led you to the house that you're in now. That's right. Um, so when I was talking about messages and, uh, and emails from people who'd read the Salt Path, uh, that's how we came to be here. Um, I had a message on Twitter in the very early days when I had touched social media before, I had a message from someone on Twitter said, I'd like to be in touch, can I have your phone number? So without, without a thought, I gave them my phone number. And uh, when, I, when I spoke to um, the person on the other end, they said, uh, I've read your book, I've read The Salt Path, and I feel I'm really so connected to your story, so connected to, to what you went through, that I really, I, I think you're the ones. And I said, what, what are you talking about? The ones for what? And uh, this person on the other end of the line went on to explain that they had a, a neglected, overused farm, literally just up the road from where we were living. And he invited us to come and live here and to help fulfill his dream of bringing the biodiversity back to the farm. Well, we were like immediately, no, can't possibly, because how can we trust anybody? We can't possibly trust anybody again after what we've gone through. You might be thrown out all over again, exactly. You it can't. It yeah. all go wrong again. So we hesitated and, and procrastinated and, <laughs> and held back as long as we could. But then we came to visit the farm late one evening and just as it was getting dark, we'd been looking out of one of the bedroom windows in, in a farmhouse that had been empty for a long time and was full of It was damp. a bit damp, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> damp and mould and mice. And we were just, just about to shut the window as this deer, one, one row deer, jumped out of the hedge, just walked slowly in front of the house and disappeared into the shoulder high grass on the, on the other side. And just in that moment, we said, yes, let's do it. Let's just put all the fear and the, the hesitation aside. Let's just grab the moment and take a huge leap of faith. And, and that's what we did. We, we jumped and, uh, and we came to the farm and that's where we are now. I have another question from Gwynnie, from Gwynnie Fraser. I was going to ask you this myself, and she's uh, it's a very good, good point. Do you have a routine with your writing? What is the process of putting it into expression? Do you write lots of drafts or does it come into words easily? I'm an early morning writer, that's for sure. Uh, I, I tend to wake up when it gets light. So I'm definitely my most productive in the summer. Um, I think I wake up, I put the kettle on, I open the front door and I start writing because that's the moment when all my thoughts and the, everything seems to combine and I'm, I'm there, I can put myself in the moment and write. But I think there's, there's 
I found now having written two books that I do have a sort of way of writing but when I can find that that way it, it's easy and, and I have to really just put myself into the moment I'm trying to explain put myself into that that place and really inhabit it and then when I can do that then I'm there and it's not writing it's just explaining what's happening and and then it's easy yeah easy I can't I mean it, it comes very easily but it is not easy <laughs> you just have a gift you're talented uh, I have not a, it's not a question but it is a comment and it's a very nice one can you swim this is the question badly Sadly, okay. You may not want to do this, but you've got an invitation. Uh, this is from Sarah, who says, I swim in the Solent with a group of women called the Sandy Beards. And we have all read your book. We all love nature and the power of the sea and the weather on our souls. If you are ever in our area, we would love you to come for a swim and a coffee and cake after. Thank you for your wonderful book, Sarah. So That's if you're ever in the area, you can go and swim in the Solent. Absolutely wonderful, Sarah. If you've got some armbands, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm slightly with you on that one. Um, hang on, I've got another one. Uh, Sarah Jane got in touch as well to say thank you. We asked her question earlier, but uh, it's been fascinating hearing you talk and she hopes that you enjoy your next planned walk on that long path, which we don't know which one it is. And Samantha, Samantha says, what sort of books do you like to read? I read a really wide variety of books. I can't say as I read one genre. I think I, I grew up in a, in a household that had a bookshelf full of books, but they were, they were predominantly um, Mills and Boone or Western. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, probably by the age of eight, I'd read just about every Mills and Boone that had been published and an awful lot of uh, gun-toting Westerns. Um, but then, then there was a library opened in the village where I went to school when I was a teenager and that sort of changed everything and then I just I just read everything that I could get my hands on. Um, at the moment I'm reading a stack of books that have been sent to me for, from people who'd like to know what I think about them and that's a huge pleasure because I get books that I wouldn't normally I wouldn't normally look at so I think mm. I think that's the real pleasure about surprise books through the post as you read genres that you might never go near and mm. you know what you find <laughs> um now are you going to write another one because you know I, i've obviously read this i need another one now Raina. i've had i've got everybody else has got to wait another two days because you can't buy it until thursday but i've read it so i need some more are you going to write any more because you write quite quickly i would love to because i think i think now i've started writing i just love the process i love it the thought of it when i, I think about writing it's really daunting and i don't know where to start and i don't know how to hang two words together but then when i get into it it's it's like it's like i've immersed myself in my own private world and everything else disappears completely and i mean i mean my own universe and and I, I just love the process. So yes, definitely going to write something else. But you might just um, have to take a short while. <laughs> okay, a little while. You're going to have to do that long walk, aren't you? Uh, Jan Kaywood says, is your story, I uh, assume she means the salt path, is it going to be dramatised? Are we going to see it on the big screen or on TV? And who would you want to play you? Oh, well, um, well, it has been optioned and Ooh. it's in the process. They've found a screenwriter, I can tell you that. And so it's in the process of, creation well this whole um film production thing is quite new to me and i've got to say i don't really understand it but um it's it's an ongoing process that might result in a film how exciting who would play you then do you think who would play me well i've i've always had this idea of olivia coleman in my head simply because <laughs> of the humor and, and, and the irony in it all but then she went and won an oscar so that she probably wouldn't be interested oh, in anyway, so. what, what do you mean she wouldn't be interested yours is a <laughs> fantastically critically acclaimed massive success she may well be i think you're i think you actually look like a younger meryl streep that's what that's why with all long hair that, you know, okay. i think you're rather glamorous i think rather well, glamorous yeah. so, you know, especially with your mum and <laughs> background there um right two more questions for you what is your favorite part of the north devon coastal path uh, karen barkley asked because she moved to north devon a few months ago north devon it's got to be those incredible cliffs of exmoor just those incredible incredible 
cliffs that are like how can i describe them you go down <laughs> <to> sea level <laughs> and then straight back up to 800 feet and the the path comes within about half a meter of the cliff edge and if if you don't lean backwards then you could very well be flying with the gulls it's just <laughs> such a, it, it's 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 not just a walk it's it's a wild experience there so it's got to be there absolutely <laughs> um and linda and melanie jennings say can you tell us what moth studied at university please you talk about him building on his experience he um had a lot of experience in the, on the land in horticulture and he went on to study uh, sustainable horticulture and landscape design so anybody who needs a sustainable garden he's your man <laughs> I, I love the way you're looking off screen because is he there He's there, yeah. Come He's on, there. Moth. Let's get Moth in. Come on. I wanted to meet Moth when I first spoke to you. Come on, Moth. <laughs> Have a chair. The man himself. <laughs> Hello, Moth. Here he is. <laughs> how, how, very, how very lovely to see you. How are you? Uh, I'm very well this evening. Thank you, Sophie. You're looking very well and very, very smiley, as I said, as always. Um, you, must, <laughs> you must be very, very proud of your wife. Oh, uh, uh, so so proud i can't say she's a, an amazing woman really really keeps me on my toes <laughs> and did you not have any idea that she could write at all um no not at all i, I know we, we we like so many folks we we enjoy reading and we uh, thoroughly enjoy taking books and stories apart and uh, and trying to you know feel, you know express her feelings and you know just just just, just discuss a, a very good story but no not that she could write completely yeah, she's, surprised me she's she has definitely done you proud and uh is she about she won't tell me where she's going on the next long walk so don't don't reveal it but is she about to drag you off on another one uh yes she is the uh, the training regime has already been set up so. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that why she had a rucksack out the other day uh, oh yes yes the rucksacks <laughs> and the, the the most comfy insulating mat we could possibly find Oh gee whiz, yes, we were, <laughs> we're on something. <laughs> yeah, because I've been weighing my uh, sleeping bag again. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, give it a few months before you know. Get let the winter go through, and then maybe a springtime yes. walk. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna take your dog? You've got. No, I met you. You had a dog. Are you gonna take the dog with you? Oh, I don't know. He's got very short legs, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. He has a limit of about three miles, so we 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 same <laughs> fine. <laughs> Well, listen. I'm going to uh, I'm going to leave you both there because uh, it is so lovely to see you both. We we've you know I've met Raina before and I've met you very briefly, but it's uh, you know both of you are such a wonderful couple and it's such a fantastic. Both books are so inspiring and hopeful and full of love, and that's what I think we all come away with is that lovely rapport and relationship and everything that you two have together. So wonderful to see you, Moth, and lovely as always to talk to you, Raina and uh, let us know when you have the next walk and I can't wait to read some more of your brilliant writing. Thank you Sophie, it's been lovely. <laughs> Thank you. All right, have a lovely evening both of you. You too. You too, good night. Bye. 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 Bye.